Welcome back to Philosophy 220, Intro to Ethics. Uh, today we are going to uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, ethics and war. So, as a, a way of getting started, we might just take a, a, a very famous and controversial uh, decision, the uh, decision by uh, President Truman in uh, 1945 to drop the atomic bomb on the cities of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, uh, 1945, uh, the uh, uh, war was nearing its conclusion, and the uh, decision to be made was whether or not to uh, invade the island of Japan. And uh, what uh, Truman felt, along with uh, some of his advisors, was that the uh, invasion of Japan would entail a uh, very immense loss of life uh, both on the part of uh, American soldiers and on the part of uh, the Japanese. The idea that um, many subscribed to was that the Japanese would fight to the death and there would be massive loss of life. And so uh, with this new technology of atomic weaponry, uh, the idea was that uh, dropping the bomb would actually in the long run save lives. So note, utilitarian decision that Truman made, that the decision to, to drop the bomb, uh, even though it ended up killing uh, approximately 100,000 people, uh, that decision, uh, at least in Truman's mind, saved many individuals. Uh, however, uh, these were devastating weapons. Only those two bombs resulted in those uh, approximately 100,000 deaths, and uh, of course these massive weapons indiscriminately killed uh, mostly civilians, men, women, and children. All right, so now if we think about the relationship of, of ethics and war, uh, we might think of just what we might think of as a prima facie or on the face of it considerations. Uh, on the one hand, it seems obvious uh, that a war uh, is not just simply because inv a war involves killing. Uh, so this is the initial hurdle that justifications of war uh, have to get around. That if we're going to talk about it being morally justified to go to war, uh, we have to explain uh, in what way that uh, killing can be justified and in, in, in what circumstances. So a standard uh, argument is that um, uh, killing is justified in cases of self-defense. So on an individual level, uh, this seems uh, plausible to many of us. If someone comes after me uh, with a weapon with a deadly intent, I'm justified in defending myself, uh, even to the point of uh, deadly intent uh, in return. And uh, certainly we might think of cases where this uh, can apply uh, to uh, war, although it's important to note that uh, war uh, involves not only killing um, people who intend to kill you, but pretty much inevitably involves the killing of, of innocent bystanders as well, particularly in the case of modern warfare. Uh, so if we drop a bomb, and we're much better at this of course than we used to be, but if we drop a bomb, uh, you can't guarantee that the uh, innocent are not going to be killed alongside of, what, of the people we, who we might think of as guilty, or the uh, non-combatants along with the combatants. Uh, this is seen in contemporary conflicts in, in uh, Afghanistan and uh, Iraq and now uh, Libya as well. And so the issue of war involves not only the issue of self-defense, it also involves the issue of, of when is it acceptable to kill um, otherwise innocent individuals in the, uh, the name of uh, some greater good, which suggests that war almost inevitably involves a kind of utilitarian justification. Uh, in addition, there's a second kind of consideration. So, uh, when we talk about reasons to go to war, sometimes we might invoke the principle of, of self-defense, and uh, some cases that might be true in, in a literal sense, that my life uh, individually may be threatened by the invasion of some uh, foreign force. But it's noteworthy that when we talk about uh, modern conflicts, we often invoke more abstract principles. Uh, liberty, democracy, uh, capitalism, right? 
And so note what's being applied there. If we're going to war for liberty, democracy, and capitalism, we're not going to war for simply self-defense in a literal sense, protecting my life. We're going to war for uh, certain kinds of values or, or certain being able to live a certain kind of life. And so what that entails is that um, uh, certain kinds of lives are worth dying for, or uh, certain kinds of freedoms, not just the lives, certain kind of freedoms are worth dying for. And so that's a bit stronger kind of claim to note. And so when we ask about justification of war, we ask the question, well, how do we justify that? Now, um, a distinction here. And when we talk about uh, justification of war, there's uh, two terms that are typically used, uh, use ad bellum and use in bellum. So uh, basically the justification of war and justification in war. And uh, we're going to be talking here basically about the justification of, of, of war. When is it uh, justifiable from an ethical perspective to go to war? Uh, this is distinct but related to the uh, issue of, of justice in war. Once a war is committed to, what practices are justifiable in war or not? Are there rules of war uh, uh, once war is committed to? Uh, modern theories of, of war uh, strongly uh, uh, endorse a view that there are at least certain basic kinds of rules of warfare that, that ideally uh, should be committed to. And so uh, fair treatment of prisoners, we might think of the Geneva Convention uh, as one sort of a, uh, agreement that suggests uh, some kind of ethics in war. So uh, these are separate but related issues. Let's go ahead and focus on just on the issue of, of justice of war. And here we might note just three kind of broad kinds of arguments. And so the first two we'll, we'll treat relatively briefly and then we'll get to the last one here. Uh, so let's take just the pacifist argument uh, first, which I, I mentioned in passing. Uh, so if you're a pacifist, you believe that uh, war is wrong. And there are, there are different kinds of, of pacifists, but, but let's just take the, the strongest case that says that war is always wrong. Uh, and, and the argument here would pretty typically be a, a deontological argument. So if you're a deontologist, there are universal moral rules, and those rules are binding on everyone. And one of the universal moral rules is simply that murder is wrong. A war on the pacifist argument involves murder. Uh, and because of this, uh, war uh, should never be uh, committed to. It involves killing other people. Uh, now, uh, if I appeal to self-defense, the pacifist might say, well, self-defense uh, is a good principle. Not all pacifists would say that. Some pacifists would say that even self-defense, uh, we should not engage in, in uh, mortal injury. But even if self-defense holds, the pacifists will say it doesn't really hold to uh, in the case of war because only rarely are we defending ourselves against someone who's directly attacking us. Often enough, when we're in war, we're shooting people who maybe will shoot at us, but maybe shoot at someone else. Uh, we might be firing artillery. We might be dropping bombs from planes, and all of this is much more indiscriminate killing, which the pacifist is opposed to, in addition to the killing of, of non-combatants. Um, pacifists sometimes make other arguments as well. Um, one of the arguments that pacifists make is that uh, if we go to war, this just makes it easier for others to go to war as, as well. Um, as an example, this is um, uh, perhaps not the clearest example, but when the United States uh, went to a war first against Afghanistan and Iraq and, and declared a war on terror, uh, critics of the war noted how other regimes uh, used this language of the war on terror to uh, uh, commence hostilities uh, within usually their own borders or in their own locale. Uh, and so the idea the pacifist suggests is that uh, the willingness to go to war only makes war more likely uh, in the future. Uh, in addition, if you look at modern warfare, modern warfare is very expensive. If you look at the number of dollars that are devoted to defense in, in the U.S. budget, 
Uh, and if you start thinking about what those dollars could be used for instead of going to war, there's an awful lot of good we might do uh, instead. And which might actually serve to prevent wars uh, better than uh, actually building up a large military. Okay, now, those are standard uh, pacifist arguments. Uh, the difficulty with a pacifist position, uh, particularly in the absolute form, is uh, that it seems to allow um, too much harm to be committed not only against oneself but one's community. If one truly is pacifist, and, and if we take this to the national level, uh, where we see nations as a whole as pacifists, this doesn't seem to really end war as much as just allow us to be victims of the people who are really nasty. And so, um, uh, perhaps an example here might be uh, in the early 90s uh, when the, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed um, and the Cold War ended. Uh, one of the things that happened is all of these sort of local rivalries that were kept in check by, uh, to some extent, by the superpowers suddenly uh, burst into flames again. Uh, notably in, in the former country of Yugoslavia, which descended into civil war, but in other places as well. And uh, one of the things that keeps the small bad actors in check is larger good actors. At least this is what the critic of pacifism would say. And without those larger good actors, then we would just be at the mercy of, of really bad people all the time. 